Excerpts from Part 1, Chapter 4 of Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand Plundering Germany The luxury steamer Manhattan, bearing the 1936 U.S. Olympic team to Germany, was barely past the Statue of Liberty before Louis began stealing things. In his defense, he wasn't the one who started it. Mindful of being a teenaged upstart in the company of such seasoned track deities as Jesse Owens and Glenn Cunningham, Louis curbed his cultish impulses and began growing a mustache. But he soon noticed that practically everyone on board was souvenir collecting, pocketing towels, ashtrays, and anything else they could easily lift. They had nothing on me, he said later. I was phi beta kappa in taking things. The mustache was abandoned. As the voyage went on, Louis and the other light fingers quietly denuded the Manhattan. For a Depression-era teenager accustomed to breakfasting on stale bread and milk and who had eaten in a restaurant only twice in his life, the Manhattan was paradise. Upon rising, the athletes sipped cocoa and grazed from plates of pastries. At nine, there was steak and eggs in the dining room. A coffee break, lunch, tea, and dinner followed, nose to tail. Between meals, a ring for the porter would bring anything the heart desired, and late at night, the athletes raided the galley. Inching around the first-class deck, Louis found a little window in which pints of beer kept magically appearing. He made them magically disappear. When seasickness thinned the ranks of the diners, extra desserts were laid out, and Louis, who had sturdy sea legs, let nothing go to waste. His consumption became legendary. Recalling how the ship had to make an unscheduled stop to restock the pantries, Runner James Louval joked, Of course, most of this was due to Lou Zamperini. Louis made a habit of sitting next to the mountainous shot putter Jack Torrance, who had an inexplicably tiny appetite. When Torrance couldn't finish his entree, Louis dropped onto the plate like a vulture. On the evening of July 17th, Louis returned from dinner so impressed with his eating that he immortalized it on the back of a letter. Pint of pineapple juice, two bowls of beef broth, sardine salads, five rolls, two tall glasses of milk, four small sweet pickles, two plates of chicken, helpings of sweet potatoes, four pieces of butter, helpings of ice cream with wafers, three chunks of angel food cake with white frosting, one and a half pounds of cherries, one apple, one orange, one glass of ice water. Biggest meal I ever ate in my life, he wrote, and I can't believe it myself but I was there. Where it all went, I don't know. He'd soon find out. Shortly before the athletes came ashore at Hamburg, a doctor noted that quite a few were expanding. One javelin competitor had gained eight pounds in five days. Several wrestlers, boxers, and weightlifters had eaten themselves out of their weight classes, and some were unable to compete. Don Lash had gained ten pounds. Louis outdid them all, regaining all the weight that he'd lost in New York, and then some. When he got off the Manhattan, he weighed 12 pounds more than when he'd gotten on nine days earlier. On the 1st of August, Louis and the other Olympians were driven through Berlin for the opening ceremonies. Every vista suggested coiled might. Nazi banners had been papered over everything. As much as a third of the male population was in uniform, as were many children. Military units drilled openly, and though powered aircraft were forbidden under the Versailles Treaty, the strength of the burgeoning Luftwaffe was on conspicuous display over an airfield, where gliders swooped over impressed tourists and Hitler youth. The buses had machine gun mounts on the roofs, and undercarriages that could be converted into tank-style tracks. The city was pristine. 
Even the wagon horses left no mark, their droppings instantly scooped up by uniformed street sweepers. Berlin's gypsies and Jewish students had vanished. The gypsies had been dumped in camps, the Jews confined to the University of Berlin campus, leaving only smiling Aryans. The only visible wisp of discord was the broken glass in the windows of Jewish businesses. Few nations had dominated an Olympic event as Finland had the 5,000-meter races, winning gold in 1912, 1924, 28, and 32. Lori Littinen, who had won gold in 32, was back for another go, along with his brilliant teammates Gunnar Hockert and Ilmari Salmanen. When Louis watched them train, noted a reporter, his eyes bulged. Louis was too young and too green to beat the Finns, and he knew it. His day would come, he believed, in the 1,500, four years later. In the last days before his preliminary heat, Louis went to the stadium and watched Owens crush the field in the 100 meters and Cunningham break the world record for the 1,500, but still lose to New Zealander Jack Lovelock. The atmosphere was surreal. Each time Hitler entered, the crowd jumped up with the Nazi salute. With each foreign athlete's victory, an abbreviated version of his or her national anthem was played. When a German athlete won, the stadium rang with every stanza of Deutschland über alles, and the spectators shouted Sieg Heil endlessly, arms outstretched. On August 4th, three 5,000-meter qualifying heats were run. Louis drew the third, deepest heat, facing Lettinen. The top five in each heat would make the final. In the first, Lash ran third. In the second, Tom Deckard, the other American, failed to qualify. Louis slogged through heat three, feeling fat and leaden-legged. He barely caught fifth place at the line. He was, he wrote in his diary, tired as hell. He had three days to prepare for the final. While he was waiting, an envelope arrived from Pete. Inside were two playing cards, an ace and a joker. On the joker, Pete had written, which are you going to be? The joker, which is another word for horse's ass, or the tops, ace of spades. The best in the bunch, the highest in the deck. Take your choice. On the ace, he had written, let's see you storm through as the best in the deck. If the joker does not appeal to you, throw it away and keep this for good luck. Pete. On August 7th, Louis lay face down in the infield of the Olympic Stadium, readying himself for the 5,000 meter final. 100,000 spectators ringed the track, Louis was terrified. He pressed his face to the grass, inhaling deeply, trying to settle his quivering nerves. When the time came, he rose, walked to the starting line, bowed forward, and waited. His paper number, 751, flapped against his chest. At the sound of the gun, Louis's body, electric with nervous energy, wanted to bolt. But Louis made a conscious effort to relax, knowing how far he had to go. As Louis flew around the last bend, Hawkert had already won, with Lettinen behind him. Louis wasn't watching them. He was chasing the glossy head, still distant. He heard a gathering roar and realized that the crowd had caught sight of his rally and was shouting him on. Even Hitler, who had been contorting himself in concert with the athletes, was watching him. Louis ran on, Pete's words beating in his head, his whole body burning. The shining hair was far away, then nearer. Then it was so close that Louis again smelled the pomade. With the last of his strength, Louis threw himself over the line. He had made up 50 yards in the last lap and beaten his personal best time by more than eight seconds. His final time, 14 minutes, 46.8 seconds 
was by far the fastest 5,000 run by any American in 1936, almost 12 seconds faster than Lash's best for the year. He had just missed seventh place. As Louis bent, gasping over his spent legs, he marveled at the kick that he had forced from his body. It had felt very, very fast. Two coaches hurried up, gaping at their stopwatches, on which they had clocked his final lap. Both watches showed precisely the same time. In distance running in the 1930s, it was exceptionally rare for a man to run a last lap in one minute. This rule held even in the comparatively short hop of a mile. In the three fastest miles ever run, the winner's final lap had been clocked at 61.2, 58.9, and 59.1 seconds, respectively. No lap in those three historic performances had been faster than 58.9. In the 5,000, well over three miles, turning a final lap in less than 70 seconds was a monumental feat. In his record-breaking 1932 Olympic 5,000, Lettinen had spun his final lap in 69.2 seconds. Louis had run his last lap in 56 seconds. Louis was led into the Führer's section. Hitler bent from his box, smiled, and offered his hand. Louis, standing below, had to reach far up. Their fingers barely touched. Hitler said something in German. An interpreter translated, Ah, you're the boy with the fast finish. The Olympic village wasn't empty for long. The cottages became military barracks. With the Olympics over and his usefulness for propaganda expended, the village's designer, Captain Furstner, learned that he was to be cashiered from the Wehrmacht because he was a Jew. He killed himself. Less than 20 miles away, in the town of Oranienburg, the first prisoners were being hauled into the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. On the evening of September 2nd, when Louis arrived in Torrance, he was plunked onto a throne on the flatbed of a truck and paraded to the depot, where 4,000 people, whipped up by a band, sirens, and factory whistles, cheered. Louis shook hands and grinned for pictures. I didn't only start too slow, he said. I ran too slow. As he settled back into home, Louis thought of what lay ahead. Running the 1936 Olympic 5000 at 19 on four races experience had been a shot at the moon. Running the 1940 Olympic 1500 at 23 after years of training would be another matter. The same thought was circling in Pete's mind. Louis could win gold in 1940, and both brothers knew it. A few weeks before, Officials had announced which city would host the 1940 Games. Louis shaped his dreams around Tokyo, Japan. <laughs>